Start with one, start with one process, you know, start with a VA that you can pay for five hours a week and start small, like figure out one thing that you can delegate to them, whether that's invoicing, whether that's uh, something extremely small. I, I see that all the time. People are so afraid to just delegate that first task, but that's really what entrepreneurship is. You need other people. It's a team sport entrepreneurship. <laughs> Welcome back to the Outsourcing and Scaling Show. My guest today is Christian Chasmer. Christian, how are you doing today? I am doing fantastic, Nathan. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to have you. For those who don't know, Christian empowers entrepreneurs to build their businesses with systems that give them freedom. He works with CEOs and young people who are out to impact the world in a big way. At 26 years old, this young entrepreneur has already built two successful companies without sacrificing his lifestyle to stress and burnout. He's all about systems, 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 which is what something that I like to hear. I'm a big systems guy. And we're going to talk all about that. But first, let's take a gigantic step back. What were you like growing up as a kid? Were you a straight A student? Were you a rebel? Did you always know you wanted to be an entrepreneur? Yeah, that's an awesome question. Uh, I was a straight A student. I had good grades, but I was also a rebel. So basically, my mom told me, get straight A's and get to college. And that was about the only rule. So I did that. And then I partied and did all these other bad things as a teenager. So I kind of, I kind of straddled the line between both. And no, I didn't, I didn't know I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I never even really heard of an entrepreneur. I didn't know any adults that read for leisure. I grew up in a really small town uh, to where, you know, if you wanted to make money, you either became a banker and moved to New York city or you became a lawyer and moved to New York city. So I didn't really have any entrepreneurial, uh, I didn't think that entrepreneurship was a thing that I could do. And can you tell us more about your story? I mean, how you go about going from someone that, that didn't know anything about entrepreneurship to getting into it and starting your first company and then your second? Yeah, sure. So I was, I went down to university of South Carolina for college and I was on the pre-law track and just kind of doing my thing. I was a business student, but I didn't really care about business. I was just kind of that party collager and one day I actually came into a classroom and there was a piece of paper on my desk and it said, run your own business over the summer, make $10,000. And I had 30 bucks to my name. So I said, dang, sign me up. I'll do anything for $10,000 over the summer. And what it wound up being was a franchise opportunity where I ran my own exterior painting business over the summer. So I'm familiar I, with that business. I yeah. turned that down back in the day. I didn't want to do it, but I, I'm familiar with what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I did that. You know, you knock on doors, you learn how to sell to customers, you hire your own painting crew, and then you run and manage your own painting crew over the summer. So basically, I, I call it a six month learning how to run a business through the fire. You just get thrown in and you learn how to run a business. And after that summer, I realized that entrepreneurship was the, the way for me. I was obsessed with entrepreneurship. I also realized I was a really crappy entrepreneur and a bad manager at that time too. So I needed to learn how to be a better person and I needed to learn how to systemize businesses. Awesome. And, and how, what was your, your first like real entrepreneurial endeavor after the painting? Yeah. So I did that uh, a second year down in college. And then I actually moved up to Boston and started my own division of that company. So teaching college students how to do that and having managing them to run their own branches. And me and my partner up in Boston, we built that up to about $1.2 million in 10 months. And from there we said, okay, cool. We understand how to build a, a thing from scratch. Let's go do it on our own. So we left the student painter business and started our own real estate development company. And that was kind of the first fully on our own thing. And we started out, you know, doing wholesales and knocking on doors and really grinding because uh, we just left our jobs and bet all of our, all of our money on this business. And we, we scaled that one up in two years to about $6 million. Wow. That's awesome, man. What ended up happening with that business? Uh, I wound up systemizing it. So like I said, I got really obsessed with systemized systemization. So built out the processes, built the great team. And I was able to move out to San Diego once the day-to-day -day operations were systemized. And from there, I realized that I loved building businesses. I loved helping entrepreneurs. I didn't love real estate development that much, um, but my partners did. So I wound up selling my business, my part in the business to my partners and some outside partners. So you talked about systems. What does that, what did that actually look like? We're using Google docs. We're using different software. How do you go step-by-step step in building those systems so other people can follow them? 
Yeah. So I think a lot of, a lot of people try to get fancy with the systems and they can use fancy software and there's, there's tons of that. We got down and dirty with Google docs and Asana and that's what we use to this day as well. So we literally, we started out by knocking on doors, right. And then having sales, sales interviews with people and then potentially buying their houses. So we started systemizing that we wrote down step-by-step step exactly what we were doing, what our scripts were, how we were doing it, how we were tracking with, which was a Google sheet. We were tracking doors, knocked on contacts, appointments set up, et cetera. And we just started writing it out, scripting it out, systemizing it, and then taught college students how to do that. And then once I got out of that part, I started learning how to systemize the actual flipping of houses, the development, the sourcing, et cetera. And we just wrote down what we were doing in Google Docs and started teaching it to other people to where by the end, we, were, we had college students literally banging on phones, calling agents, using our scripts, using our way of online sourcing properties and buying properties uh, for us. And why college kids? Because I always think college kids are a terrible investment. You invest a lot of time. It's not their top priority. Why go that route instead of a, a VA or, or someone that, that's out of college that knows it's what they want to do? And did you see that? Did you even see that turnover that I'm talking about? Yeah. So we were using VAs as well. We were using VAs to scrape online lists. We were using VAs to schedule calls, uh, executive assistant type stuff, organizing our documents, creating processes too. So we would teach VAs how to create processes as well, where we would just record it and they would type them out. Uh, we used the college students because it's what we knew in the beginning, right? We came from student painters where we were teaching college students how to run their own business. So we had a different perspective on college students that given, given the right training and given the right responsibilities, they can surprise you and they can do amazing things because they want to learn. So we, we got lucky. Well, I guess flat half luck, half system with our hiring process and finding the right college students to do the phone calls and the sourcing. But we did have some VAs as well doing the back end items. Let's talk about that hiring process. I mean, it took me five years to really come up with a good hiring process that I trust that a high percentage that came out the other side would be good and invested. What did that process look like on your side? Yeah, our hiring process, we, we imitated a lot from the top grading structure. So top grading in the book, Who by Jeff Smart. We took a lot of that. So we used top grading interview to go through the work history form. We always go with that. We did core value interviews. We had ref referral interviews. So we would, which is something that everyone really should do is we actually called the people's references and we interviewed them uh, with a structured set of questions to really figure out one, is this person BSing us, right? You, you do get to find the truth. But two, which I found most important is I'm understanding how to coach them for when they get hired now, because hearing about the other, per the manager who used to manage them, you're hearing about strengths, you're hearing about weaknesses. So I'm understanding how I can coach them. So we did take a lot from the, the who format, and then we kind of sprinkled in our own uh, couple of items as well. So you got, you've the, all these people you've hired, you got some VAs, you got college kids. How are you organizing that? I mean, are there meetings? What's that culture look like? What's going on after the hire, after you start implementing these systems? Yeah. So we use Asana for our onboarding process, right? So we have every single step in the onboarding process written out in Asana. So I, I think that the first 30 to 60 days in an employee's lifetime is super, super important. It's one of the most important parts. So onboarding is super specced out. But in terms of managing, we had our daily huddle. So we would meet every single day at 9am. My team still does that uh, every day, 9am. And we would talk for 15 minutes about what did you do yesterday? What are you doing today? What are your blockers, right? YTB. And from there, we had a weekly meeting as well, a 90 minute weekly meeting, which kind of models traction by Gino Wickman slash scaling up with Vern slash my own stuff as well. So that weekly meeting is mostly about issues and following up on our OKRs. So what are your biggest objectives and key results for the quarter? Where are you? What's your confidence level? And then what are the big issues holding our business back? So that was our meeting rhythm. Plus we had quarterly offsites and yearly offsites as well, but that was the big meeting rhythm. We didn't have too many other meetings besides that. Um, one thing we did differently and I try to do in every company is be as transparent as possible as well. It with, 
everything, all the business challenges, all the ups, all the downs. We were very honest and we relied on our team to understand our biggest challenges and make the right decisions from college student all the way to VA in the Philippines. Like Florence, one of my VAs, like she knew everything that was going on in the business. She understood it. She was able to look at the P and L and figure out what was going on. And I think that just helped create a, a level of ownership in the company. And I, I still, try to do that in all of the companies I'm ever involved with is create that transparency and that open book policy, really. Do you have a, a bad hiring story, maybe a horror story that you can share with the audience? <laughs> yeah, tons. Um, oh, man. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of hires that we thought were going to be great. And then after two weeks, they fizzled out. They just couldn't handle the high pace, the intensity. Um, I had one hire that was pretty bad. Uh, back in my student painter days that he came on the team. It didn't look like it was going to be a good fit, but I really needed painters. I was, I was really in a grind. And that's usually what happens, right? Especially early on in your entrepreneurial career, you you think, okay, I just need a person. I'm going to skip the process, right? Like I'm, I'm not going to listen to my gut. I'm just going to bring them on for bodies and that never works out. Right. Uh, but I, I did that my first year as an entrepreneur brought them on. They were not great. They kept missing deadlines. They were just, they had a bad attitude, et cetera. And then one day I walked on the job site and he, the person painted the gutters, which you're not supposed to do. Like he just painted the gutters because he was just lazy, right? You're supposed to cut around them. And I'm getting into the weeds here, but I, I asked him, I said, Hey, what, what are you doing? You're painting the gutters. I specifically like, we, that's not what we do. And he looks up at him. He goes, they look better this way. And I just said, get off my job site. You're, you're done. You're fired, man. He was, you know, there was a little, little exchange at that point, but I had to, at that moment, I had to let him go. And that was a big realization of, you know, bodies for the sake of bodies is not the case. You want to find A players and I'd rather slow down to find the right people than to just bring people on. So that was one of my lower points of, a, of my management career. I had, I had my whole team leave me actually that year as well. The whole team left in one day. I had $50,000 still to produce and nobody to produce the work. So that was also a pretty big low point for me. How did you recover from that? Oh, man. I felt like a total failure. I I knew I wasn't going to quit, but I didn't know how I, I really just felt like a complete failure. And then somebody who I really respected, who he used to do student painters. Now he runs an eight figure business, $20 million logistics company. He was just saying, Hey, you know, you know, it's so funny that you're in this position because you can't, you know, you can't fail. Like if you don't quit, you can't fail. And I know you're not a quitter Christian. And that just kind of hit me in the face of like, Oh man, I can't fail if I don't quit. So I went back I did the whole hiring process, found a whole team, trained the team with a whole training that I put on on my own and finished out the work. So it was, it was a grind, but it was a good lesson to me too. Well, let's talk about your book, uh, Lose the Limits. And I know a lot of entrepreneurs, they, they have those limiting beliefs. What do you see? I mean, you're talking to entrepreneurs all the time. You're coaching them. You're helping them. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. So for me, limiting beliefs is a huge, huge part it was a huge part of my life still is. And I think it's a big limiter for everybody, right? It's the beliefs that you're not good enough. It's the beliefs that you can fail. It's the beliefs that people won't like you if you go this certain way. Uh, specifically to entrepreneurs, I see a lot of limiting beliefs around their capability. Like they don't think that they're worthy enough of being a leader. So they kind of bring themselves down a little bit, which obviously puts a growth on the business, puts growth on them as a, a leader and capable of hiring and bringing on a team. So I see that as a huge limiting belief a lot of times with entrepreneurs and that's where they hit that glass ceiling where they just can't get past. Like a lot of entrepreneurs will get past hit there at that six figure mark where they're just about to start bringing on a team and scale their company. Uh, there's a lot of limiting beliefs around the worthiness or the skill to bring that on. And then at the million dollar mark, $2 million mark, et cetera. What about people that are just struggling to build systems or, or to hire, to build a team? What advice would you have for them? Start with one, start with one process, you know, start with a VA that you can pay for five hours a week and start small, like figure out one thing that you can delegate to them, whether that's invoicing, whether that's, uh, something extremely small, create a video or document it in a Google doc, and then just give a VA five hours a week, two hours a week for the first month. Like I, I see that all the time. People are so afraid to just delegate that first task. 
but that's really what entrepreneurship is. You need other people. It's a team sport entrepreneurship. So just start small and test. Completely agree. What else did I miss? We're, we're getting towards the end. Is there anything that, that I didn't cover that you'd like to share? Cool, oh, man. Uh, I feel, I feel like we're, we're hitting the whole gamut here. I, I would just reiterate what, what we just talked about. And Nathan, I know you, you preach this a lot about delegation and using VAs and using executive assistants. Like my life completely has changed since I've gotten my executive assistant and I would never be without one, but not even an executive assistant, but any type of virtual assistant to do a lot of things. Like a lot of people say, well, I wouldn't know what I would delegate to them. And that stops them, right? It stops them from going on to free up. It stops them from creating those processes. But once you actually just take that first step and take that test and write that first process, uh, it unlocks a whole different door and a whole different idea of entrepreneurship. And you go from a technician to a real entrepreneur. Love it. Christian, this has been great. Where can people find out more about you and what are you most excited about for the rest of the year? Yeah. Uh, so people can find me at elevateyoursystems.com. So they can just head to the website or they can uh, reach, reach me on Facebook and LinkedIn as well, Christian Chasmer. And what I'm most excited about is our company Elevate. Uh, we have a really cool we have a really cool offering going, actually helping people build systems and processes and really start to delegate and scale up their company. And I'm really excited about that. You know, we're just, every time a client tells me that their life has changed and they can go on vacation with their wife now, or they can actually do the things they want to do because they're freeing up that time. And they're also able to make a bigger impact with their company. Uh, that's what gets me going. So just continuing to uh, grow, grow, elevate. Love it. Christian, thanks so much for coming on and have a great rest of the week. Yeah, absolutely, Nathan. Have a great day, man.